The first reading is the, from the book of Philemon, uh, chapter 1, there's only one chapter, um, verse 1 to verse 21. It's on page 1200 in the Bible. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, also to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers, because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement, because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than a Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you <clears throat> for my son Onesimus, who became my son whilst I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favour you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident in your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. The second reading is from Luke 14, verses 25 to 33. The cost of being a disciple. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying that this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he's able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your presence with us here this morning. Thank you for your word through which you speak to us. I pray that you would give us open hearts. Amen. Amen. So it's lovely to see you all this morning. For those of you that I didn't get to meet over tea and coffee, uh, my name's Rowena, and I'm joining you today from Embrace the Middle East. Um, good morning to those of you joining online as well. So Embrace partner with Christian organizations all over the Middle East. So at the moment we work in Israel, Palestine, Lebanon, Syria, Egypt and Iraq. And our partners in the region are doing the really hard and important work on the ground. They work in education, community development, healthcare and women's empowerment. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about our partners a bit later on. 
About a month ago, I celebrated my first wedding anniversary. I married my husband, Mark, on the 7th of August last year, and we looked back this year and celebrated a paper anniversary, I believe it is. Um, so we looked back at our photos, which I've had all good intentions of putting into an album, but I haven't quite got round to it yet. But we also thought about all the planning that went into the day last year. So all the decision making, you know, menu choices, drinks choices, deciding which dress to buy, which suits to hire, uh, who to have a videographer or is a photographer sufficient, all these decisions we had to take into consideration. Um, and it was probably one of the most expensive days of our lives. But it was so worth the cost to have everyone who's loved and supported us over the years to be there on our significant occasion. And it was worth it for what the commitment means that we made to each other before our friends and family and before God. Some things are costly, but worth it. So in this passage in Luke that we've just heard, Jesus is talking, we're told in verse 25, to the large crowd that was traveling with him. Often we see Jesus respond to a question or speak directly to someone. But here he is addressing the crowd, so we know that what he's saying is important for everyone to hear. In verse 27, Jesus says, Anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Now, this is quite a bold statement. Obviously, as we read this today, we know that Jesus was going to die on a cross. And he had already told his disciples at this point that that was going to happen, but the rest of the crowd didn't know. However, they knew that this was an important figure of speech and they knew what it meant. That in the Roman world, before a man died on a cross, he had to carry his cross to the place of execution. And so hearing Jesus say this, his listeners would have been horrified by this image. They knew that the cross was an instrument of death, suffering and shame. And by using it here, Jesus is trying to make the point that following him is hugely sacrificial. Sometimes there are things that we have to give up completely in order to follow Jesus. That's sometimes what he asks of us. Other times, God will ask us to sacrifice or surrender things to his will. And it requires us to give of ourselves, even if we aren't giving up that thing completely. So things like our finances or our jobs, things that he wants us to surrender to him that he can use. In verse 26, Jesus says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, he cannot be my disciple. Now, I'm very blessed to have grown up in a Christian household. My parents were both raised in Christian families, my dad here in the UK and my mum in India. And her grandfather, so my great-grandfather, was converted from Hinduism to Christianity. It was over 100 years ago now, and it was when he, he came across a travelling preacher that was in his village. Now, he was so gripped by what this preacher was saying, he was so gripped by the gospel of Jesus, that he ended up following him around uh, over a few villages because he just had to hear more of what this man was saying. And eventually his family came out and looked for him. It was before the days where they could call or give him a text. So he said to them, I want to become a Christian. Don't be silly, they responded. You can't become a Christian. He was so convinced that they said to him, if you want to do that, none of us will ever speak to you again. You'll have to leave this village. And he did. He ended up leaving his village and his family, and they never spoke to him again. Now, I love that story because it's a huge part of who I am. It's a huge part of my testimony. If my mum wasn't a Christian, my parents literally wouldn't have met. But it also shows us an example of the true cost of discipleship. 
My great-grandfather believed that Jesus was so worth following that it was worth giving up his family. And so that's what I think of looking at verse 26. We are not called to hate our families in the sense of being hostile towards them. We know that Jesus calls his followers to love even their enemies, but we are called to love Jesus so much more than those whom we love most on this earth. The NLT version puts this verse like this. If you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. I.e., you must love me so much more, is what Jesus is saying. And the story that I've just shared about my great-grandfather is obviously a very rare case. It was a long time ago, it was over a century ago, and a very different culture to the culture that we have here. But for many of us, our family members and many of our friends aren't followers of Jesus. So what does that look like for us? We may often find ourselves in situations where they don't understand our way of life as Christians. How many of us have friends and family who question or disapprove of our life choices? Maybe how we spend our time and how we spend our money. Who we decide to spend time with how we raise our children. Maybe we have even made compromises in our Christian lives to please those whom we love. As Christians, we will not please everybody. And how much harder is it for us to displease those whom we are closest to? How much more sacrificial it is? Jesus goes on to say in verse 26, If anyone comes to me and does not hate even his own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Does how we spend our time and money reflect that the kingdom of God is our priority? Are we putting Jesus above our own desires? What about when our plans don't work out? What about when we lose our job or lose someone close to us? When God doesn't answer our prayers? You know, we were singing that song earlier, the Matt Redman song, and one of the lyrics really struck me. Um, When I walk in the desert place, sorry, when there's pain in the offering, I think that line really spoke to me because sometimes it hurts. In those times when things are hard, it hurts to offer praise to God. But do we trust God even in those times? Following Jesus means trusting him even when things don't go our way. And as we launch Gift Day today, we are thinking about a generous God who is worthy of our giving. He is worthy of our discipleship. Jesus is worth everything because he denied himself. He took up his cross, literally, and died for us. 1 John 4 says, we love because he first loved us. We are only reciprocating the great love of God towards us. Paul says in 2 Corinthians verse 8, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, though he was rich, became poor, so that through his poverty you might have great riches. Now what are those riches? Firstly, we have God himself. God our Father, Jesus Christ our friend, and the Holy Spirit our helper. We have been given the gift of knowing God himself, the Holy Trinity. We also have the relief of knowing that our sins are forgiven, the hope of eternal life and the joy with God, the blessings of fellowship with God's people including this wonderful community that you have here at Sunnyside. I'm reminded of the words of one of my favourite hymns, When I Survey. So I'm just going to read the last verse. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. It's because Jesus, our God, 
has given us everything, that we give everything to him. I'm now going to tell you about our Christian brothers in the Middle East who do know the true cost of discipleship. So we've been talking about the cost of following Jesus. Now, at the moment, there are some other costs which, which I'm sure won't have passed you by. The increase in the cost of living is affecting all of us. On my drive here this morning, I had my eyes open to see if petrol over this side was any cheaper than it is in High Wycombe, where I live. I don't think it was, but it was worth looking. Here in the UK, the annual inflation rate increased to 8.2% in July. Now, Embrace's partners in the Middle East are feeling the effects of the crisis even more than we are here. For example, Lebanon's annual inflation rate in July was 168%. Before the pandemic hit in 2020, Lebanon's economy was already struggling. They were already on the brink. And then the pandemic hit, and then they had an explosion in the port of Beirut in August 2020, which you may remember seeing. It was all over the news at the time. But now the effects of the war in Ukraine have made things even worse. Over 80% of Lebanon's wheat is imported from Ukraine and Russia. Now, the explosion in 2020 destroyed the silos, meaning that they are unable to store wheat for longer than a month, even when they do get it. We're hearing from our partners out there that the bakeries are often out of bread. And when they do have it, it's unaffordable to many, as 80% of the country's population live in poverty. There are also around one and a half million Syrian refugees now living in the country. Lebanon's population is a third refugees, which is obviously a huge percentage. And 90% of these refugees live in poverty. So I'm just going to tell you about one of our partners called JCC who work in Lebanon and they work in the refugee camps. One of these, Dubai refugee camp, is just north of Beirut and it is very overcrowded. It was built in the late 1940s to host Palestinian refugees and now after the influx of Syrian refugees there's many of them living there as well. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of frustration and resentment in the camp. JCC have set up a community centre there and it provides a bit of peace in what is a very challenging environment. Children and adults can go to a library. They also have craft workshops, language classes, job training, life skills courses and summer carnivals to bring the community together. Now, the director of JCC is a lady called Sylvia, and she is now over 80, and she is running the organisation with vigour. Some of our staff at Embrace, and I'm sure many others have as well, have been encouraging her to find someone else to take over from her at JCC, but she is adamant that she's not going to retire just yet. Her own home was damaged in the blast in Beirut in 2020, and as she's lived there a long time, she's seen the impact of the many challenges the country has faced over the last few decades. She sadly lost her husband recently, and due to the economic crisis, she's also lost all of her husband's life savings. All of her grandchildren live abroad, and she is just adamant that she won't leave, not yet, at least. We're hearing from our partners over there that more and more people are leaving due to the economic crisis. In other countries we work in, such as Israel and Palestine, many are leaving as a result of the occupation. In Iraq, we have partners who are working with Syrian refugees out there and also Iraqis who have been displaced from the invasion of ISIS in 2014. Those events in 2014 did force many Christians to leave. But for those that stayed, it really lit a fire under the Christian community. One of the priests that's part of one of our partner organisations told us about how he remembers sitting in the tents with, when all these displaced Iraqis came. He sat in their tents with them and he did catechism with them and really forced them to examine their faith. And it's those people now who are leading the response with Syrian refugees. 
The church there is full of young people who are filled with hope. There are many more stories that I could tell you of these people who are living in one of the most difficult regions in the world, but they decide to remain there to serve those who need it the most. And when we've asked our partners what inspires them to carry on, they tell us that it is in part the knowledge that they're not alone. Not only do they know the presence of God, but they also know that his presence is expressed in a large part by our support. They are there working on God's behalf, but also on ours as part of one body, the church. And the wonderful thing is that we are all connected to this work through the body of Christ. And we are so grateful that this gift day, you are partnering with us too, along with other organisations. And so I'm just going to quickly tell you about our prayer diary. Um, I've left some copies in the room next door. So if you feel called to pray, please do. There's a different partner that we pray for each week. And we follow along as a staff team. We have a prayer meeting each week. And before the pandemic, we did this in person. So we would all meet in a room in our office in Amersham. Um, when the pandemic hit and we started doing everything online, we realized that we could actually invite our partners to pray with us. So for over two years now, our partners have been joining us online each week. And we've had some really amazing times of fellowship and seen real answers to prayer. So... If you would like to pray along, please do take a prayer diary. I've also brought some magazines. Um, our new magazine dropped last week, but because of the postal strikes, we haven't received them yet. So I'm going to make sure to send some to Rebecca, um, along with our new Christmas catalogue. So we've got all our new Christmas cards. And I was speaking to Joy earlier, um, and she's one of the people that instigated this relationship between Sunnyside and Embrace and she was telling me it all started with a Christmas card um, I think she received one from a friend and um, found out about Embrace through that so we're very grateful for that so I'm going to pray now um, so let's just take a minute <clears throat> 